So happy to uh, welcome you and to introduce Xiao Zhao. Xiao is a graduate of Mount Sinai. And I had the distinct pleasure of mentoring her as a Howard Hughes Medical Student Research Fellow after her second year? Third year. Third year of med school? No, second year. Second year. Second. Okay. She's not, not surprised me. She's gone on to great things. She's uh, did her internal medicine residency at Yale, was a chief medical resident, and moved to Penn for a GI fellowship. and. Uh, actually returned to Zebrafish, which she had worked on a bit with uh, Kristen Sadler and I when she was at, uh, when she was here, and uh, has more recently worked mostly with Michael Pack, in a terrific model of biliary disease, and that's what she's here to share with us today. So, welcome back. Thank you. Thank we you so you. much. Well, I missed you guys too. So, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. As Scott mentioned, I graduated from Mount Sinai as a medical student in 2008, so it's more than a decade ago at this point. So it's, I'm definitely very excited to come back and see old mentors again, as well as old friends. So today I will share with you some of the mechanistic insights and therapeutic insights into biliary atresia, which I think it's also a great model to understand cholangiocytes, um, the injury processes, uh, I mean the processes driving cholangiocyte injury. So, as um, and I hope also, you know, through the talk today, to also convey to you the broader implications of our findings, which I think has overall improved our understanding of mechanisms underlying the differential cellular capacity to undergo stress. So I don't think I need to convince anyone here why the liver is the most fascinating organ in our body, other than its tremendous regenerative on capacity, the liver also serves many important metabolic functions, while lots of research actually has been devoted to the study of hepatocytes, which make up more than 90% of the liver cell population. Much is less known about cholangiocytes, which are epithelial cells lining the biliary tract that also serve many important secretory functions as well as metabolic functions, such as bile transport, modification of bile acid, and bicarbonate secretion. So it is increasingly evident now that Cholangiocytes are actually a highly dynamic and heterogeneous group of cells. For example, cells, the biliary cells lining the intrahepatic biliary system are very different than the cells lining the extrahepatic biliary system consisting of the gallbladder as well as the larger bile ducts outside of the liver in terms of their developmental origin. As you can see here, Hepatocytes and intrahepatic cholangiocytes actually share the same embryonic origin and they're all derived from hepatoblasts. Whereas the extrahepatic cholangiocytes are derived from the ventral endoderm, which also gives rise to the pancreatic duct. So given this heterogeneity, it is not a surprise that many cholangiopathies differentially affect different parts of the biliary tree, with some attacking the intrahepatic system and others attacking the extrahepatic system. So biliary atresia is predominantly known as uh, extrahepatic cholangiopathy that is characterized by fibrosis and obturation of the extrahepatic biliary tree. So although a lot of etiology has been proposed over the years, nothing has been conclusively proven. And the patients are usually present in the first month of life. And there's often a delay in diagnosis as it is hard to differentiate between physiological jaundice and pathological jaundice. And it has a variable incidence of 1 out of 5,000 births to 1 out of 15,000 live births with no gender variation. And although the adequate biliary drainage can be re-established via a surgical decompression procedure known as the Kasai hepatoporinterostomy, most of the patients go on actually to develop um, significant liver fibrosis and cirrhosis making BA the most common indication for liver transplantation in the pediatric population. So a lot of what we know about BA today is actually derived from the rotavirus mouse BA model. So this model has definitely taught us the importance of the role of innate as well as adaptive immunity in driving BA pathogenesis, but as all models, it is not perfect. So it doesn't really capture all the cardinal features of human BA, and neither has the rotavirus or any virus been um, conclusively implicated in the human disease. So I will actually start today's seminar by describing to you a new experimental model that we have established in our lab based on naturally occurring BA outbreaks in newborn livestock in Australia. So it's quite a fascinating story from there. And we have also, I will also discuss some of the 
important molecular pathways that we have identified that we believe are mechanistically relevant to human BA. And I will devote the last part of the talk to talk to you about a screen that has identified um, FDA-approved compounds um, that we believe may be of therapeutic use in the treatment of BA and potentially other cholangiopathies as well. So there actually has been four epidemics of BA in newborn as a livestock in Australia for the past 50 years, with the most recent one occurring in 2013. So this is a picture taken during one of the BA outbreaks, and you can see here the lamb that was born appeared frail and sick. And necropopsies actually performed later showed an absence of the extrahepatic biliary tree and significant liver fibrosis, consistent with the human pathology. And what the vets noticed is that all these droughts had, I mean, all these epidemics had something in common, and that, that is that they all occurred during seasons of severe droughts, when the pregnant mother, sheep or cows, had access to pastures of land that's usually underwater. And they were grazing on this plant belonging to the Dysphania species, which is also a type of red weed. So the hypothesis at the time was that there was something toxic in the plant that was responsible for the epidemics. So in order to test that hypothesis, our collaborator, Dr. Rebecca Wells at Penn, actually contacted the vets in Australia, had the plant collected and imported into the US. But as you know, a plant contains thousands of organic compounds. And in order to find the responsible compound, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And we needed a system that would allow us to screen through multiple compounds in quickly but accurately. And this is where the zebrafish came to be a really handy system. So zebrafish has been used as a model organism to study multiple biological processes, including early development, neural generation. It has multiple advantages, including external fertilization of the embryo, the optical transparency of the larva, making them easy to manipulate, visualize, and image. The larvae also develop quickly. So by five days post-fertilization, all the major organs are developed. And we can start feeding them. So although the time between each generation is actually the same between fish and mouse, which is about three months, with each mating, we can generate a large amount of offspring. And it is also a powerful tool to study human GI and liver diseases because the fish has a conserved hepatobiliary system as mammals. As you can see here in a fluorescence picture of a transgenic fish, that marks the biliary tree, the fish also possess an intra uh, intrahepatic ductal system that merges to form the common hepatic duct. And the gallbladder is connected to the common hepatic duct via the cystic duct, which then merges to form a common bile duct that drains, in the, in the case of fish, by alcohol from liver to the proximal intestine, just like in mammals. So our lab has previously modified a uh, biliary excretion assay that would allow us to screen for any biliary um, abnormalities in the larva of zebrafish based on the green fluorescent fatty acid analog by DPC-16. So if we incubate fish in media containing C16, a five-day-old fish after all the major organs are developed, uh, we can observe accumulation of the fluorescence in the gallbladder and intestine of the fish within two hours. As the fish ingests the C16, and as it gets excreted in bile. And any biliary abnormality, including one similar to the BA pathology, can be recognized by the absence of the fluorescence in the gallbladder and in the intestine. So this is sort of an equivalent of an oral cholecystogram, which has been used in the past to diagnose gallstones and biliary obstructions before the use of ultrasounds. So we use this assay to help us screen through our plant extract. So our, our first chemist collaborator actually just fractionated the plant into three crude fractions. And he said, feed them to the fish, and if you don't see any toxicity in any of them, I'm done here. So there is no project. So what we did is that we fed, as he suggested, you know, in each individual portions to the fish and screened for any biliary abnormalities um, using the C16 assay. And we found out of the three, one was active. So we, he fractionated that further, and we did that repetitively until we reached a fraction that contained about two compounds. 
And we found that the active compound is this isoflavone that has never been described before. And based on his structural analysis, he told us right away this is going to be a very avid electrophile or oxidant because of this exomethylene ring here. And in vitro analysis has shown that this is capable of binding to multiple biological macromolecules such as glucathione, amino acids, and DNA. And of course, the C16 was just a screening assay. In order to really validate the action of this compound, we actually performed both histological um, analysis as well as confocal microscopy on zebrafish larva that was treated with the toxin. And we found that this toxin selectively targets the extra hepatic biliary tree in a dose-dependent manner. As you can see in methylene blue section here of a control zebrafish larva, there is a nice layer of epithelial cells mining the gallbladder as well as the cystic duct. However, all these extra hepatic biliary structures are destroyed after biliary tree zone exposure. And this can be better seen in confocal microscopy of fish immunostained with the anaxin A4 antibody, which marks the biliary tree. As again, you can see here in a control fish, you have a nice looking gallbladder and a beautiful network of intrahepatic bile ducts. However, after biliary tree zone exposure at the standard dose, we see selective destruction of the extrahepatic system and preservation of the intrahepatic system. We do not observe such significant biliary damage with the low dose of the toxin. So now that we have an experimental model to study extrahepatic biliary disease, in this case BA, as well as to study biliary damage in general, the natural question that begs is what are the molecular mechanisms that are activated by this toxin? And I was immediately also very intrigued by the selective toxicity profile of the toxin. You know, so we, we know that isoflavones are known to be extensively metabolized by the hepatobiliary system. So it is not really a surprise that organs such as the heart or the brain are not really affected by this toxin because they're probably not exposed to it. But the question is, why are cells such as hepatocytes and intrahepatic uh, cholangiocytes also appear to be resistant to this toxic insult? So in order to answer those questions, we did initial global transcriptional profilings of liver of, to um, of toxin-treated fish and compared it to DMSO-treated controls. And we found that this toxin led to the activation of multiple evolutionarily conserved stress pathways that are involved in redox homeostasis as well as proteostasis. Again, consistent with the in vitro data showing this as an avid oxidant that are capable, that is capable of binding to multiple macromolecules. In order to see if this stress response pathways are differentially upregulated in hepatocytes versus cholangiocytes, we actually did cell type specific gene profiling using a methodology known as translating ribosomal affinity purification or TRAP. So here we have generated transgenic fish that express a ribosomal fusion protein either driven by a biliary promoter, KRT18, or a hepatocyte specific promoter, FABP10. And we're able to use anti-GFP magnetic beads to pull down the polysomes from the respective cell types and then perform gene expression analysis using the N counter analysis system, which is a digital color code barcode technology that allows for multiplex measurements of gene expression. And we found that actually pathways involved in redox stress are pronouncedly activated in both biliary cells and hepatocytes as evidenced by the significant upregulation of genes involved in glucathione synthesis as well as metabolism. So to give everyone here just a brief refresher on what glucathione is, it is a tripeptide that is made out of glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. That is the also, it's also the most important antioxidant in our body. It is known to be important for the transmission of redox signals. It can neutralize xenobiotics such as biliary trees on, through direct conjugation, but it can also indirectly detoxify reactive oxygen species through redox cycling as it oscillates between the oxidized form of GSSG and the reduced form of GSH. Interestingly, hepatocytes are the major supplier of GSH for other cell types, including clandrocytes. As you can see here, as, hepatic, uh, as GSH is made in hepatocytes, it can be transported across the cannulicolite membrane into bile duct 
where it will get uh, where it get rehydrolyzed into its constituent amino acids again and get reabsorbed by chlandrocytes for resynthesis. So in a way, chlandrocytes really depend on hepatocytes to supply its GSH pool. So based on these initial in vivo expression studies as well as an in vitro analysis, our hypothesis is that GSH redox signaling probably plays a really important role in mediating this biliary injury that's induced by this electrophilic compound. And we wanted to know exactly what does biliary treason do to the GSH levels in vivo. So we measure GSH content in zebrafish larval liver post biliary treason exposure and found that it led to a, a dose dependent depletion of GSH. And this is done through mass spec. So you can see here exposure to the standard dose of the toxin led to almost a 60% reduction in GSH at four hours post exposure, which persisted at 12 hours, but eventually the GSH level would return back to normal at 24 hours, suggesting there is some kind of compensatory mechanism. So this is a global but rather cursory view on this question. It doesn't really tell us how does biliary tree zone affects the different types of the liver cell types within the liver. Neither does it really tell us if all the liver cell types possess the same redox reserve. So in order to answer those questions, we turned to a genetically encoded biosensor that would allow us to actually detect minute changes in the GSH redox state of a cell. So it is actually based on an engineered GFP that's able to excite at two different wavelengths, depending on the redox state of the cell. So if a cell is very reduced, meaning it has an abundant amount of GSH, very little GSSG, then the sensor will excite at 488. However, if a cell is very oxidized, meaning either due to GSH depletion or GSH oxidation, the sensor will excite at 4 or 5. So based on this information, we can obtain ratio metric images, which would then allow us to calculate the cellular redox state of a cell. So with a very low ratio of 4 or 5 over 4, uh, 488, that would indicate a very reduced state, whereas a high ratio would in indicate cellular oxidation. So this has been successfully used in drosophila as, as well as mouse tissues to study redox signaling, and we actually use it to map GSH redox status in hepatocytes, intrahepatic cholangiocytes, and extrahepatic cholangiocytes at baseline, as well as after biliary treason treatment. So here is a typical ratio metric image. So the gallbladder here is shown by the red arrow, um, and the intrahepatic ducts are visualized via a uh, M-cherry transgene that's driven by the notch-responsive promoter, TP1, and it's pseudo-colored here green, actually, for better visualization. Of course, the remainder of the cells are mostly hepatocytes, as it is the most abundant cell type in the liver. So based on our quantitative analysis, we found that this toxin led to pronounced oxidation of extrahepatic cholangiocytes, while the redox status of the hepatocytes and intrahepatic biliary cells appear to be minimally affected. What's even more interesting is that we found that the extrahepatic cholangiocytes possess a very oxidized GSH pool at baseline without any type of exogenous toxic insult compared to the intrahepatic cholangiocytes and hepatocytes. And we really wanted to know what accounts for just differences in basal redox status as well as inducible redox response. So in order to answer some of those questions, we systematically disrupted components of the GSH metabolism pathway via the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. So we first engineered a frame shift mutation into the GCLM gene, which is responsible for glucathione synthesis. It's the rate limiting step for glucathione synthesis. And we also engineered a frame shift mutation into the ABCC2 gene, which encodes for the transporter MRP2 that is responsible for transporting GSH from hepatocytes to the bile duct. And lastly, we obtained a uh, mutant 9 from the Sanger Center that contains a nonsense mutation in the GSR gene that would make for defective GSR regeneration. So in order to validate the functions of these um, um, mutations, we measured, again, GSH content using mass spec. And not surprisingly, the GCLM mutants exhibited a greater than 80% reduction in GSH levels um, in their liver, whereas no such reduction was observed in the ABCC2 mutants as well as the GSR mutants. 
since ABCC2 mutation affects GSH transport, not GSH synthesis, we actually measure GSH in bile extracted from adult gallbladder of the ABCC2 mutant fish, and we found that this mutation led to a greater than 60% reduction in GSH. So consistent that our mutations are doing what they were expected to do. And all the fish tolerated these disruptions to their GSH metabolism pathway well, and they appear morphologically normal and are viable and fertile, with the caveat that they're like that under unstressed conditions, but things change when they're stressed. So we really... Sean, did you, did you uh, look in the adult gallbladder at the impact of the GCLM knockout? Uh, there, I, we didn't. We didn't do that. Yeah. But I would presume it's probably still like a 80 to 90 percent reduction. Yeah. So, um, so we then wanted to, we then checked actually how this mutations individually affected the different redox state of the different liver cell types, as well as their response to electrophilic stress. And I can tell you without delving into the nitty gritty details here, a lot of our findings were expected. For example, we found that cellular oxidation predisposed a cell type to electrophilic stress. That is not really that surprising. However, there were also exceptions to those rules. And here, I think the exceptions actually defines the rules. So we started with the GCLM mutation, which is defective in GSH synthesis. And not surprisingly, this mutation led to cellular oxidation in all three cell types that we examined. What's interesting here is that the redox heterogeneity is actually maintained, with the extrahepatic biliary cells still being the most oxidized cell type. And we also found that manipulation of GSH synthesis actually altered the toxicity profile of this toxin. So you can see here in wild type fish, Treat it with low dose of the toxin, we don't actually see any significant biliary damage. However, when the mutant fish is exposed to the same dose of the toxin, we not only observe significant destruction of the extrahepatic biliary system, but now we find significant damage to the intrahepatic cells as well. And we do not observe this in the heterozygote state. So this suggested to us that intrahepatic biliary cells are really dependent on GSH synthesis to combat electrophilic stress. But our next experiment using the GSR mutants shows that they do not really rely on GSH regeneration. So again, like in the GCLM mutation, this particular mutation um, mutant led to cellular oxidation in all three cell types, which is not a surprise because there's presumably more presence of GSSG, which is the oxidized form of GSH. While the oxidized extrahepatic biliary cells are predisposed in the mutant larva, as you can see here, to low dose biliary trisome, it looks like the intrahepatic bile ducts are preserved and they're spared. So this and even though the fact that is that the intrahepatic, the redox state of the intrahepatic ducts are oxidized. So it shows that cellular oxidation does not necessarily is not the perfect predictor of cellular susceptibility. The other interesting thing here from this experiment is that we actually observed sensitization of the extrahepatic biliary tree um, to this toxin, even in the heterozygote state, despite those cells having the same redox reserve as their wild type siblings. Again, another incidence that basal redox reserve is not, um, uh, basal redox state is not the perfect predictor of the cell's capacity to overcome stress. So lastly, we looked at the ABCC2 mutants, and this particular mutation, since it affects GSH, GSH transport rather than synthesis, we expected to see cellular oxidation in the, both of the biliary cell types, and that's what we, we saw, while the hepatocytes would retain a very reduced state. So this cellular oxidation predisposed both cellular types, biliary cellular types, to electrophilic injury. The interesting thing here is that we observed similar sensitization again in the heterozygote state. And this is particularly surprising because the intrahepatic cells, as you can see here in the heterozygote state, doesn't really have a lot of cellular oxidation compared to their wild type siblings. So again, this is an indication that generic variants may appear pretty innocuous or harmless at the baseline under unstressed conditions. However, under the right exposure, they can really produce both a cell type to toxic injury. So overall, just to summarize what I've talked about so far, we have now developed a new experimental model um, to study BA based on a toxin that arises from oxidative injury associated with the activation of 
um, conserved stress pathways. And there are definitely cell type specific properties that define the selective injury pattern as well as the disease phenotype. And we found that the extra hepatic cholangiocytes may be particularly sensitive to electrophilic stress because of their low redox reserve as well as their insufficient redox response. So in addition to studying redox signaling, we are also very interested in another pathway that's involved in protein quality control known as the heat shock response, which I'm sure everybody here probably is familiar with because it's a pretty well characterized pathway. Because our trap studies show that there is significant activation of pathways involved in proteostasis in both hepatocytes and cholangiocytes after biliary tree zone exposure, as evidenced by the significant upregulation of genes involved in heat shock response, as well as the unfolded protein response and ER stress. So it's not a surprise that our toxin would induce proteotomic stress. It is capable of binding to amino acids. So presumably, it can cause protein oxidation, leading to protein misfolding. So that's not really a surprise. And as you may recall, um, the heat shock chaperone machinery plays a really important role in maintaining proteostasis. So in, in the setting or under proteotoxic stress, a misfolded protein can be bind to the heat shock chaperone HSP70, which can then transfer this misfolded protein via the help of adapter proteins such as HOP to another chaperone known as HSP90. HSP90 then help the misfolded protein to refold into its native state. And when that's not achievable, the misfolded proteins can be degraded via the proteosomal, ubiquitin, uh, proteosomal system. So we wanted to study the role of this in mediating or modulating biliary tree zone toxicity. So again, we systematically, and this time pharmacologically, disrupted this pathway. So we first inhibited HSP90. We are a known HSP90 inhibitor, 17 AAG. And we found that HSP90 inhibition actually sensitized the extra hepatic biliary cells to electrophilic stress. Then we tried to see if we can mitigate this process by activating HSP90 um, we are known HSP, I'm sorry, HSP70, activating HSP70, we are known HSP70 activator, GGA, and we actually failed to attenuate the biliary damage. This suggests that HSP90 is probably the rate limiting enzyme here in helping the proteins to refold. So at the same time, we were actually interrogating this pathway. Our collaborators at CHA came to us independently because they have all the exome sequencing data of patients with isolated BA along with their parents, and they really wanted to know some of the functional significance of the genetic variants they have discovered. Um, they want to know if there's some kind of causal relationships that we could establish using our model. And one of the variants that really jumped out, out at me immediately was in the gene steep one. And as you can remember from this particular um, graph, steep one is just another name for this co-adapter here, HOP. So it is known to be a co-chaperone for both HSV70 and HSV90. And out of 27 co-chaperones that's known out there, it's the only one that's stress-inducible. So this particular variant is found in one patient, but only restricted to isoform 3 of this gene. And interestingly, the interesting thing about this isoform is that it contains 50 extra amino acids at the end terminus, and it's unique to primates. So it's not present in mouse, and it's not present in zebra fish. It has a real allele frequency of 0 0.002 based on public databases and has not been previously associated with our disease. So the first thing we did is to see if this gene actually plays a role in modulating biliary tree zone toxicities that we knocked out the zebra fish, uh, zebra fish version of um, steep one where CRISPR, uh, where via CRISPR path mine again. And we found that the steep one no fish are embryonically lethal, just like the steep one no mouse. And the steep one, uh, steep one heterozygous larvae actually appear normal under unstressed conditions. However, when we expose them to biliary trees, we actually see selective sensitization of the extra hepatic biliary system. <clears throat> and since this mutation is restricted to one isoform that is primate specific, we wanted to interrogate the function of this particular isoform by examining how its specific knockdown in human cholangiocytes could impact biliary tree zone toxicity. So we achieved this by transfecting H69 cells, which is a well-established um, human cholangiocyte cell line, with deep one isoform specific sRNA. So as you can see here, this particular sRNA experiment resulted in uh, almost a 
percent reduction in that one isoform of steep one, which correlated to about a 20 per 20% reduction in overall steep one expression, suggesting this is not the most dominant transcript of this gene in a human clangicide. We also did a complementary experiment in which we transfected the H69 cells with uh, sRNA that would target all variants of steep one, and which led to an 80% reduction in overall steep one expression. So we used microtubal destabilization as a marker of biliary damage in human cholangiocytes because our collaborator Becky Wells has previously shown that this toxin leads to microtubule damage in mouse cholangiocytes, presumably due to a loss of cellular polarity. So as you can see here in our tubulin stainings here uh, of uh, cells transfected with the control sRNA and also exposed to low dose of the biliary treason, we do not really see any apparent microtubule damage. However, in cells transfected with either the isoform-specific sRNA or uh, the sRNA that targets all steep one variants, we see a pronounced uh, reduction in tubulin staining, suggestive of significant amount of microtubule damage. So this suggested to us that although this isoform is not really um, the most predominant transcript, it actually plays a really important role in, in mediating um, electrophilic stress. So, to summarize this part of the talk, we have found that redox and proteotoxic injuries play a significant contributory role in the pathogenesis of BA. We've also identified variants that do not alter the basal redox state of a cell, but they could profoundly predispose the cells to electrophilic injury under the right conditions. We've also found a human mutation that could be cautiously linked to genetic modulations of the protein quality control pathway, hence linking the human disease to our experimental model. So I will spend the last part of the talk to talk to you about FDA-approved compounds that we have uncovered in a screen that we believe are of therapeutic use, potential therapeutic use for this disease. So as you know, CASI remains the mainstay treatment option for BA, and there has been a trial recently that was published that showed the use of steroids following this procedure failed to actually improve biliary drainage or transplant-free survival. So therefore, there is really no effective medical treatment. There's a surgical treatment, but there's no medical therapy for this disease. So as soon as I realized that redox signaling was important in modulating biliary treason toxicity, the first experiment I have if an acetylcysteine, which is a known GSH precursor that's also used in the hospitals to treat Tylenol toxicity, would attenuate this injury process. And we found that it, indeed it does, at least temporarily. As you can see here, biliary treason alone led to a selective extrahepatic toxicity, biliary toxicity, which was prevented when we co exposed the fish to an acetylcysteine. We do not observe such um, protection with a lower dose of NAC. And this is presumably because NAC actually prevented the depletion of GSH uh, after biliary treason exposure. However, if we were to prolong this treatment beyond 24 hours, the toxin always wins. So this suggested that we needed additional compound that would either work synergistically with NAC or independently of NAC that would mitigate the biliary injury process. So in order to found those compounds, we screened actually a library of known drugs, more than 1,500 of them, for their ability to mitigate the biliary injury using the C16 assay again. And this was a really successful screen in the sense that all the drugs that we have identified, almost all of them, belong to only one class, and they are phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So as you know, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, also known as PDE inhibitors, prevent the hydrolysis of secondary messengers such as cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP, and there are many of them out there. The most famous one, of course, is caffeine, which is nonspecific in nature. So others include aminophilin, which is nonspecific and has been used in the past to treat asthma exacerbation, milleron, which targets subtype 3 of PDE, and prevents the breakdown of cyclic AMB has been used in the CCU to treat heart failure. And Vandonafil, which is um, targets subtype 5, um, is used, of course, well known for erectile dysfunction as well as pulmonary hypertension. It's actually used in kids as well, I believe, to treat pulmonary hypertension. So since we had this potential hit, we had to validate it, right? So we retested the larva with individual 
independently source drugs that targets different isoforms of the phosphodiesterase enzyme. And we found again that aminophilin and verdonafil actually exerted a consistent protective effect against biliary treason. And since verdonafil specifically prevents the hydrolysis of cyclic GMP, we thought we could recapitulate this attenuating effect by directly treating the fish with a cyclic GMP analog, ABR cyclic GMP, and that's indeed what we saw. So interestingly, this enhancers of the cyclic GMP signaling pathway works synergistically together with NAC. As you can see here, the extrahepatic biliary system appeared normal or minimally affected in greater than 90% of the larva that was also co-exposed to biliary treason for more than 72 hours. Just to give you guys a sense, we actually don't usually treat fish for that long outside of the system. So 72 hours post five days first radiation means they're about eight days old. And that's usually how long we would treat them, something for before we have to really feed the fish back into the system. So we actually observed um, synergistic or complementary findings um, in human cholangiocytes. As you can see here, the enhancers of the cyclic GMP pathway prevented microtubule destabilization in biliary treason treated cells, and the addition of NAC actually further improved the viability of those cells. So we really wanted to know what does cyclic GMP do? How does it really work? So we first examined if biliary treason leads to a depletion of cyclic GMP in H69 cells, and we found that it actually is not depleted. So we think this kind of drugs works more than just replenishing cyclic GMP levels. So we thought maybe it works through enhancing redox homeostasis or enhancing proteostasis. So we examined for that by seeing if, all, if any of these drugs would attenuate the biliary um, damage seen in GCLM mutants, which again is a mutant that has a defective GSH synthesis pathway. And we found that both Ardonafil and the cyclic GMP analog were able to attenuate the biliary injury that we observed in the mutant fish treated with the larva, suggesting that it actually doesn't require an intact redox pathway for it to work. So it works probably independently of redox mechanisms. But it, however, it does seem that it requires a functional proteostasis pathway for it to exert its protective effect. So you can see here, if uh, the standard dose again led to the extra hepatic biliary injury, which was attenuated by the addition of a cyclic GMP analog. However, we do not observe such attenuation if we also inhibit HSP90 at the same time with the inhibitor 17AAG, and neither do we observe the attenuation in steep one heterozygous fish treated with the low dose of the toxin, suggesting altogether that cyclic GMP requires an intact HSV90 slash steep one pathway for it to exert this work. But we're currently working on exactly what is the molecular link between that. So I think we went over a lot of things today. So I will summarize what I spoke about with our current working model. So leveraging information we have obtained about a natural phenomena we have identified an uh, electrophile or oxidant that's casually linked to BA outbreaks um, in newborn livestock. The interesting thing about this compound is that while it can induce redox stress and proteomic stress in both hepatocytes and cholangiocytes, it's only really selectively toxic to extrahepatic cholangiocytes. And we think the differential susceptibility in is the differential susceptibility profile can at least be in part explained by the cell type specific properties. For example, extrahepatic biliary cells are particularly sensitive, as we found, to electrophilic stress because they don't have a lot of GSH and they're enabled to mount in a sufficient antioxidant um, stress response. And furthermore, we have identified their collaborations with CHOP uh, mutation in a gene that's involved in protein quality control uh, in a patient with isolated BA, and seen linking our model to the human disease. We're actually in the middle of validating a second gene in the same, um, not in the same patient, in a different patient that's also part of the HSP90 pathway, but I'm not ready to present that data today. So furthermore, our genetic studies in fish show that we can have genetic variants that looks pretty harmless on unstressed conditions, but under the right electrophilic exposure, they can really predispose different liver cell types to toxic injury, sort of highlighting the 
importance of genetic susceptibility and environmental exposures in the development of complex diseases. Lastly, we have identified, sorry, how does this, yeah, through a drug screen, which speaks to the power, I think, of zebrafish, um, because we really cannot do any of those kind of screens in mouse, I think. Um, FDA approved compounds, namely anacetyl, uh, anacetylcysteine, as well as phosphodiesterase inhibitors, specifically subtype 5, um, that works synergistically together to reduce biliary injury by enhancing either the redox homeostasis pathway or the proteostasis pathway. So we're obviously, you know, these drugs are FDA approved. And once we have a mammalian model of the disease, we would love to test them in mouse and consider them for human trials as we don't really have any realistic or um, drugs out there yet for biliary atresia. So I think for the future work, you know, we're in the middle of developing a mammalian model of the disease. We were not able to do that in the past because we didn't, we relied on the plant extract to isolate the compound. We never had sufficient quantities. But now that we had a chemist to synthesize the compound in vitro, we're able to perform some of those studies that we would like to do. Okay, with that, I would like to thank my lab, especially my mentor, Mike Pack, who's been very, very supportive, as well as our collaborators, especially Becky Wells, with, without whom I don't think we would have this project today, and our chemist, Jeff Winkler, who actually synthesized the compound, as well as all my funding sources. So thank you. Great story, Chow. Thanks. So maybe I'll start. Um, so the obvious question is, EA presents as an already established disease. Mm -hmm. What's the prospects that interfering late in the disease would have any impact on the histology or the natural history of the disease? And are any of these findings relevant, do you think, to PSC and adult college geographies? Yeah, so um, I will answer the first question because I think that's an interesting one. Obviously, our model is sort of artificial in the sense that we treat the disease process very early on. As in humans, the disease often the diagnosis. There is a trial that, not a trial, a study that was published, I think, in the New England Journal that shows that a lot of the babies now diagnosed with, um, if they are found on labs to have direct hyperbilirubinia, they're more likely to develop or much more likely to develop BA or to be diagnosed with BA later. So there is a, at least a lab test now that we can use to screen babies earlier. You know, and I think the other studies that have shown is that the earlier you do the Kasai, the better the people do. So the earlier you catch the disease, the better it is. So I think our therapies would work much more effectively if we start them early, right. which I think it's possible now we have the bilirubin to, to potentially to go after. And we could, you know, in the future identify additional biomarkers. So that's the, and that's the first question. And the other experiment I actually didn't show here and I will show that is interesting is that I've always thought like a temporary exposure to this toxin would, you know, cause some damage. And then if we withdraw the toxin, the damage would be gone. We would somehow the fish can recover, the extra hepatic biliary cells can recover. That's indeed actually what they saw in cholangiocytes in the culture system. However, when we treated the fish with that experiment, we our findings were completely surprising. As you can see here, biliary treason exposure for six hours does not really cause any damage. At this point, we take the fish out, uh, the toxin, and we watch the fish again at 24 hours, and there's progressive damage here, which can be, this progression can be prevented if we added the drug therapy. Of course, this is very artificial because it's in a fish, but you can imagine if we can catch the human early enough, with the drug therapy, we could potentially delay disease progression. And your second question is how it relates to PSC and PVC. So I think a lot of the pathways we talked about today are evolutionarily stress conserved. There could be common damage pathways that's implicated in all these other diseases. And when I start my independent career, I actually really wanted to understand the molecular mechanisms that's driving this cell type specific um, behaviors. And potentially construct a gene regulatory system that's responsible for the stress responses. And I think that will tell us a lot about other cholangiopathies as well. Yeah. Um, so have you tried any other like, compounds to see if you could introduce this phenotype? 
Was it something specific with this really a tree? Yes, yeah, so there, we have not tried other electrophilic compounds, but there are compounds that's known to cause um, intrahepatic cholestasis like anet, um, but that doesn't cause extrahepatic um, damage. So we personally have not tried either of them. I just read about them in reports, but that would be a, you know, other be, things. Yeah, there's definitely, so we have subsequently, because we have now had a chemist that's able to synthesize this, right? So in the past, for the first five years, there was a lot of chemistry studies we couldn't do because they couldn't synthesize the compound. So now we can. We actually found there is a lot of other structures related to this compound that maybe it's driving its toxicity, yes. And the other interesting thing is that in that particular compound um, that we have isolated, that fraction contained two compounds. Remember I said that? The other compound is beta vagarin, which is actually a, a isoflavone that's present in food that we eat, such as chars and beets. And there are studies in the past that shows that you can make that compound toxic via the gut microbiome modulation. So it's possible that pregnant mothers may be, in a just genetically susceptible pregnant mother, they may be eating foods that could then later be metabolized to a toxic compound without knowing. Yeah. So uh, with the uh, allele, the, the genetic mutation that mm -hmm. you found in the patient, mm -hmm. um, is that is that a, a de novo mutation? It's a de novo mutation. So they uh, actually are they inherited um, forms of this. Yeah. That could yeah. Be treated potentially. Or? So. So this is, so 90% of biliary atresia occurs in the isolated form, so there's no other associated anomalies. There is 10% or 20% that's in the congenital form, and there is definitely a genetic component to that. And I, but I don't know, to be honest, if that's the same disease injury that we are seeing. We could be observing the same damage pathways because something, they may converge later, you know, but I think the inciting events is different in those cases. In the 90%? The ones, you know, the ones which have more of a genetic I don't think. Risk. Personally, I think that's more genetic it's driven. Fully, fully I mean, those people have cytosine inverses, so there's implication of cilia. So I think it's a very different kind of disease in, in that way. Yeah. They have, I mean, the studies are limited, but they've done micro work. Microarray gene expression, um, you know, out of Cincinnati on the 90% of BAs that are, you know, non congenital. Do you have overlap between that? I mean, that stuff should be publicly available between your stress pathways. So they are, I think, um, biopsies from later, those microarray studies. But you wouldn't expect, you know, um, persistence of those stress pathways to be upregulated? I mean, we can check. I didn't actually look, but right, right, because I think those a lot of them are when the livers are already fibrotic, and they're like HSB ninety has definitely been found to be upregulated in BA samples for sure, independent of those studies, it has been. But I never really know how to really interpret the the results, and obviously Cincinnati is also really known for their rotavirus model, right? And the pathway that's induced by the rotavirus model is very inflammatory in nature, so. These are the human samples. The babies that have gotten kicked out at that time, they've done um, gene expression analysis on that. So you may be a little. Right. So I will look for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No other questions, Cheryl? Great job. Thank you.